Hello, and thank you for joining us for another inspiring message from Journey Church. To learn more about our ministries, please visit us online at journeychurch.org. Now here is today's message. It's called Emmanuel. God is with us. I've asked Eric Leister to come up and kick it off. Would you give him a warm, warm Journey Church welcome? Well, good morning. How is everyone today? Oh my gosh, you're all asleep. Okay. How is everyone today? Thank you. All right, it's great to be here in God's house worshiping together. Uh, as we kick off this Christmas season, I, I, you know, there's some honesty I had to look at in myself, and I was always good at acting like this was, you know, everybody's happy this time of year, so you wanted to be happy like everybody else, um, but I never really understood why until recently, and I hope today we're able to kind of shed some of that to all of you. Um, but first, we're going to go to God in prayer. Please bow your heads and close your eyes. Heavenly Father, we want to take this moment and pause and reflect on all the things that you do for us. In specific, the gift that you gave us in the form of your son, Jesus, our Savior and our Lord, what that gift represents, and help us to stay focused this time of year at what's really important, to remember you always, keep the gospel in our hearts. God, we ask that you move through this place and that your spirit be here with us and open our hearts to what really matters. We ask these things in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. So what we want to do is, in a way, reflect on the mystery of what happened at Christmas time. Uh, and there's so much mystery around it that there's been so many, so many historians and theologians have tried to dig into the story to really understand it. And there's so, some depths they've never been able to get to. And what I don't want to do is get so deep into it and make it confusing. Um, I think it, it can be confusing. I don't want to get wrapped up in that. I don't want to get so focused on the mystery that we miss the simplicity of what happened. Um, you know, and this time of year can be um, a little stressful. Anybody agree? Um, you know, you have that, the, the first and foremost, we always think, you know, okay, well, I got to buy the perfect present for somebody. You know, you have that somebody in your life that you, you, you got to buy the thing that they never knew they wanted, but they always wanted, so they're super excited when they open it, and it was just a miracle that you knew what it was. Um, I think this is an especially stressful time for men. Can I get an amen from the guys out there? What makes it even worse is that at this time of year, your wife will lie to you. And she will say, you don't have to get me anything for Christmas. And I say, woe to the man who believes that lie. <laughs> it's not true. Um, you know, and then you have the other things. You have the decorations. How much do we decorate? Do we put lights on the house? Do we not put lights on the house? Do we decorate the inside? Do we get a tree? Do we not get a tree? Do we get a fake tree or a real tree? Well, I want a real tree. I want a fake tree. All these other things that you think about cause tension and stress. We think about what, what relatives' houses we, we have to or, or, or get to go to, who we have to go see, what parties that we're going to go to. There's a conversation that happens in our car. We pull up to a party, and I say, okay, so how long are we going to be here? And she says, can you just relax and have fun, please? Can you enjoy it? And I say, I would enjoy it more if I knew when we were leaving. <laughs> so, anybody else? So... There's, yeah, there's all these things that we go through and we get stressed out about. And, you know, I don't want the message to be another source of confusion, another source of stress. I don't want this to be complicated. And I think we can agree that as far as the standard of society and what we go through in day to day in this time of year, we've all kind of lost the focus and the real point of Christmas. So we kind of want to bring that back to basics. And I know a lot of us are familiar with the story. We know there was a baby that was born, and we know that that's supposed to mean something to us, and we should feel attached to that. Um, and I want to do my best to make this simple. And um, I actually got a friend to help me with the beginning of the message. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Audio? Sure. Hey, Brown, I can tell you what Christmas is all about. Lights, please. <laughs> and there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. 
and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid, and the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. Don't you guys love Charlie Brown's Christmas, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> there's two things we're going to pull from that. The two things that we're going to really focus on and what Christmas means were given in the announcement that the angels made to the shepherds. And, and Linus just shared with us from Luke 2.11. For unto us is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So here we go. Two things we need to know about Christmas. Number one, God gave us a gift, and that gift was a Savior. So at Christmas time, that's what we do, right? We buy gifts for one another. That's one of the ways we identify the season. Even people that don't celebrate Christmas, maybe in certain parts of the world, they don't necessarily believe the story, but that's still what they do is they exchange gifts because that's how we, we characterize this time of year. And that is good and that is right, as long as those gifts are given in memory of the ultimate gift. That gift, the angels declared, was a savior which meant that there was something that we had to be saved from and something that we could not do for ourselves. You ever had the dilemma of trying to buy a gift for someone who seems to have everything? And we all know at least one person like that, right? That if they need something, they just go get it. If they want something, they just go get it. Whether they have the money or not, they'll go get it. They always seem to have everything. And we don't know what we can get for them that they don't already do for themselves. And what God was doing for us was something that we could not do for ourselves. What he was giving us was something we cannot give ourselves that we would never be able to do. See, one of the oldest questions that we have about God is what do I have to do to get on God's good side? How can I make sure that I'm on his good side? You know, and sometimes we create in our mind, we have that image of, of you know, the scales, and we say, well, you know, I've, I've done this, and this is good, and I do this, and that's pretty good. I mean, I've done this, and this is kind of bad, so where do I stand? How does that weigh out? And we try to make sure that the good side outweighs the bad, and if it doesn't, then we, we try and be good for a little while and do some extra good stuff and, and tip the scale in our favor. But the Bible teaches that our acceptance before God can never be earned that way. We are too sinful. We are too damaged. Sin, the Bible teaches us, is, is in us like a poison. It is defilement. It has corrupted us down to our very being. Think of it like this. Let's say you were going to get a blood transfusion that was going to save your life. And right before you got that transfusion, you found out that two-tenths of one milliliter of that blood had the AIDS virus in it. Would you take it? Say, well, it's 99.08% pure. Sounds good to me. No. It's corrupt. It's defiled. Sin works the same way that it has contaminated all of us, so there is not a bit of us. There is nothing that we do that is not tainted with the sinful rebellion of mankind. So salvation had to be a gift, and it had to be accomplished by someone who was not tainted by sin. So Jesus, who was without sin, when he died under the curse of sin, he absorbed its power and its penalty, and he put it away forever for us in our place. Sometimes I feel like I say this over and over and over to myself because I have to, but Jesus lived the life we could not live. I could never live the perfect sinless life. He lived that. He died the death that I was condemned to die for me in my place, for you in your place. He took the penalty of our sin and we got the gift of his righteousness before the Father. You know, one of the last things Jesus said when he died on the cross in Greek, they write it, tetelestai, which is translated in English as, it is finished. 
And archaeologists say they found that same phrase, to tell a sty, or in Latin, it's consummatum est, written across receipts where a large bill had been paid or a debt was settled. And when Jesus said that phrase on the cross, he was saying, it is settled, it is paid. The full measure of penalty that you owed and that you owed and that I owed was paid before the Father. It was complete. Everything that kept us away from God, he took that on himself so that we could stand before the Father in his righteousness. And we call that gift righteousness, and that was given as a gift. So hear this, the essential message of Christmas is not be better, it's not be nicer, it's not go to church more, pray more, read your Bible more. The message of Christmas is that God gave us a gift in the form of Jesus Christ and he paid the ultimate price for every one of us. See, there's, there's two ways that you can spell religion. Most religions in the world are spelled D-O. It's what can I do to get on God's good side? What do I have to do to get to heaven? How much do I have to do to be a good person? And that's most religions except what Jesus taught. And what Jesus taught is that religion is spelled D-O-N-E. It's not what you can do for me, it's what's already been done by me for you. It was given as a gift. So the first question we should ask ourselves is if we died right now, would you go to heaven? And maybe some of you say, well, I, I, maybe, I, I think so. I mean, I'm 80% sure, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. Um, but you still start thinking about those scales and you think, well, hopefully God grades on a little bit of a curve. And, and listen, I don't wanna say this to be offensive, but I'm just gonna be blatantly honest. And if you feel that way, I, it just means that you've never really understood the gospel. See, the gospel is that you were so wicked before God that you could never earn your way in. You could never do enough to save yourself. But God's gift, but Christ is so complete and it gives us salvation and that's all we need is to receive that gift because it's already been D-O-N-E done in your place. If you understand the gospel as gift, then you are sure of it because it is no longer based on how well you have lived. It is dependent on the testimony God gave about his son and what Christ accomplished in your place. It's a gift. And here's one more analogy. If I came up to you and I said, hey, can you buy a beach house? Most people would say no. Some people maybe would say, well, let me look at my budget. Let me see what I can figure out. Let me move some things around and see if I can afford it. But the majority of us would say no. Now, right before I asked you that question, if I gave you a bag full of $100 million and asked you the same question, the answer may be different, should be different. See, some of us don't know if we're going to heaven or not because we're still checking our moral bank account. We haven't embraced the fullness of Christ's righteousness, and that's why we don't know. And if you understand the go that the gospel is Jesus in your place, that he switched with you and offers it as a gift to all who receive it, that changes everything. See, the message of Christmas is that Christ gave us a gift by doing something we could never do for ourselves, dying in our place, giving us his righteousness and position as sons and daughters before the Father. That's number one. Number two, the second thing we need to know about Christmas, Christ is the Lord. The angel said, unto you a child is born in the city of David that is Christ the Lord. That statement that the angel made was actually a very inflammatory one back in the, in the Roman Empire because the general consensus of the Roman Empire was that Caesar is Lord. See, the Roman world was made up of a lot of different religions and a lot of different cultures and a lot of different societies inside of the empire. And their basic idea was that we're going to let you live how you want to live. We're going to let you believe whatever religion you want. But at the end of the day, Caesar calls the shot. Caesar's the boss. He's ultimately the power. He is Lord. He's in charge. And when the angel showed up and said, Christ is the Lord, that meant no. Ultimately, Jesus calls the shots. The angel's statement was a direct confrontation with the Roman world. They said, Caesar is not the ultimate authority. God is. And that question is also a confrontation for you. Who ultimately calls the shots in your life? Who is ultimately in control? You have a lot of different influences in your life, but who's the one who ultimately makes the decisions? 
If you were honest, many of you would have to say, I am. For many of us, Jesus is an influence. We would even be so bold as to say we are followers of Jesus, and that's what Christian means, right? But the word, the word follower had a completely different definition back in Jesus' day than it does today. When we hear follower today, I think about Twitter. And I'm not on Twitter. I, under- I am on Twitter. I just didn't know I was. I don't understand it. Um, I got an email the other day that said, so-and-so is following you on Twitter. I didn't even know I had a Twitter account. Apparently, I do. Um, I don't know how it works, um, but I know a lot of people love it. You can follow anybody you want on Twitter. And maybe you read some of the stuff they post. Maybe some of it you discard. Maybe some of it you really like. And maybe some of it is an influence in your life. But to become a follower of Jesus means that he is master of everything in your life, not just one of your primary influences, not just the one who's at the top of your Twitter account. Lordship is one of those things that if it's not total, it's not real, which means if you are still telling Jesus which parts of his leadership you'll submit to and which ones you won't, which parts of his word that you'll obey and which ones you don't really want to, then you don't really get lordship. See, if you're going to follow Jesus in 99 areas out of 100, then you're still telling him where you're going to listen and where you won't. You are still in control. You still have the power. That's why when it comes to God, we say either he's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. You know, and we tend to think of sin as bad things, as, as adultery and as doing drugs and stealing, and yes, that certainly is included. But the root of sin is much more basic than that. I, I read of a youth pastor who said that the, the real problem in sin is it's the I word. It's the middle letter in the word sin, S-I-N. It's when I do what I want to do, what's going to be good for me, that I make the choice rather than what God wants me to do. It's when we want to be the point, when we have to be the boss, when we have to be the master, say, I want to be in control. So the other question to ask ourselves this Christmas, is Christ the Lord? Not not if he has the upper percentage of control, not if he is the main influence. Is he Lord? Is he in control? Who calls the shots? Is it you or is it Jesus? And I know that to say Jesus is Lord complete Lord of our life can be really hard for some of us. I understand that. We're all made of the same thing. I'm a man. I'm an American. Those are two things that makes me want to be in control, makes me think I'm the boss. I get that. But here's two things to think about when it comes to God and being in control. Number one, Jesus is the creator. God created everything in the universe, and he moves everything in the universe. He wants good for you to bring glory to him. And I'm going to get off on a, one small tangent because I've, it's one thing to say this, it's another thing to hear it, and it's another thing to fully understand, accept it, and believe it. And what I mean by that is I read these things and I was like, yeah, 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 and this was a couple years ago, and I kind of got it. But the last five or six years of my life have been just, there's been moments where we all, I think, will sit there and just look up and, want, and go, what, why? What is going on? I don't understand. Why are things so hard? Am I ever going to get a break? When are things going to change? And we don't understand. And I've just seen recently where when you really give complete control and you realize that it's not about you, and that it's about him. Even those times that made no sense and that were the worst, God was working those things to bring about his glory in the end beyond anything I could ever comprehend. He was moving people into positions and things were happening in my life I couldn't understand that show me how glorious and wonderful and amazing He really is, and how much he loves me. To bring about his glory, he will do anything and use everything, and he is the creator. And number two, he is your father, which means that he loves you, which means that he desires your good. And it means that ultimately he is the one, the only one that you should give up full control to. 
And until you believe both of those things about Jesus, you'll never really give up control. And see, for many of us, the reason we don't give up control is not a, an obedience problem, it's a trust problem. We feel like we can't let go and we can't actually surrender because that means we're no longer in control of our own lives and someone else is. So ultimately, our surrender problems begin as trust problems because when we believe, when we trust G Jesus, surrender actually becomes very natural. But there's things in this world that we put our hope and our faith into that give us power and comfort and security, and we cling to those things, and we feel like we can't let go. Those things have entrenched our hearts, and we don't know, what, we don't know why, but we say, I just, just got to believe if I save a little bit more, if I try a little harder, it'll all work out. But it won't. I bet everybody in this room has put everything they had into something of this world only to be let down. And God will never let us down. We have to trust in Christ for our salvation. And what I'm trying to show you here is that this is a God who was born. He, was, he did not come to execute justice based on what we deserve. But he came and took what we deserve. He was born as a baby and entered our pain and our poverty and took upon himself our sin, our punishment. Then he said, follow me to safety. And that is the kind of God you can trust. That is the kind of God you can turn control of your life to. See, ultimately, what we've got to know about Christmas are those two things. That we were given a gift by God because he was doing something for us we could never do for ourselves. And that Jesus is Lord. And when we understand those two things, it will cause the most profound change in your life. Because you will be overcome with the same sense the shepherds and the wise men were. The sense of majesty and worship that compels you to pour yourself out for him. This is a God, listen, that was born as a baby, who had all power but was born as a baby, who had all the riches of the universe but was born in a stable amidst the smell of manure. This was a God who rules the universe yet submitted himself to unjust treatment for your sake, for you. This was a God who was despised by the Roman rulers and who was crucified by the religious leaders, but he wouldn't let anything stop him because he was on a mission to save you. That is a God that is worthy of your highest devotion. That is a God that is worthy of your offering of your life, and that is a God that it is worthy of worship. And when you understand the gift righteousness of Christ and the lordship of Christ, it will make the most profound difference in you. It will turn you from a person that worships yourself into a person that worships him. So the last question I have very simply is, have you ever personally received the gift? John 1, 12, as the apostle talks about the coming of Jesus Christ, he said it this way, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. See, received him. It's the language of a gift. In order for the gift to become yours, you have to receive it. And have you ever personally received that gift? Have you ever leaned your whole weight upon God? Have you ever leaned it upon his gift of salvation? I'm not asking how involved in church you are, how moral you are, how much you pray, how much you give. I'm just asking, have you ever personally received the gift? Have you ever surrendered to him as Lord and received the gift of salvation? There's a great image for this that I, I came across. And it, when everybody came in today, you came in and you sat down in a chair. Probably subconsciously just came in and said, I'm going to sit here. Maybe you sit in the same place, maybe you don't. doesn't matter. You really didn't have to put a lot of thought into it. But right now, your weight is being supported by that chair. So we're in one of two positions. You can be like me where you're standing and my weight is supported by my legs. Or your weight right now is supported by that chair. And it's the same way with Jesus. You're in one of two places. You're either standing in your own authority, in your own righteousness, and your own ability to earn your way into heaven, or you are seated in the righteousness of Christ, trusting him, knowing what he did for you as a gift, that he paid the price for your full salvation and nothing you can do can earn it. 
So which position are you in? Have you ever received the gift and leaned your entire weight upon the gift righteousness of Christ? If not, as we enter the Christmas season, we want to give you a chance to receive that gift. If everyone please bow your heads and close your eyes. Again, I want to make this simple. This is not a magic prayer. There's no mantra. This is not some spell you're going to cast over God. But if the desire of your heart is surrender, it would sound like this. Jesus, I surrender. No longer am I in charge. You're in charge. Just say that to him in your own words. Jesus, I surrender. Say, Jesus, I receive. I receive the gift of salvation that you purchased for me. I'm going to trust what you did to get me to heaven, not what I can do to get myself to heaven. Say that to him in your own words, that you receive the gift. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to ask, I don't care if you've been coming to church your whole life, this is your first time. We're not going to embarrass you, it's very simple. I just, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. And I want to pray for you right where you are. So again, every head bow, every eye closed. If you said that for the first time, if you truly opened your heart and surrendered to God, if you want to receive that gift and acknowledge Christ is the Lord of your life, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand so we can pray for you right where you are. I see your hand and yours up front. Praise God. Father, I pray that for every hand that was raised and even those that didn't, we know that you are doing a work in their hearts, God. You have begun something wonderful today. You are beginning in them, and we ask that you see it through. I know you brought them here today by divine appointment so that you could personally meet them through your word and offer them this gift. Father, I pray that you would establish and solidify that which you started in them. We want to thank you for the ultimate gift, the sacrifice of your son Jesus and what that means for us. Something we could never earn or do for ourselves that you gave to us. And we ask to receive that gift and to know that Jesus is Lord. We ask these things in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Amen, amen. Put your hands together. Give God some love today, Eric. Great job. I want to thank you for making Christ your priority today and throughout the course of the month of December. To give you a little bit of a glimpse as we look ahead of the topics that we're going to be covering in the next couple weeks, I'll be back preaching next week. We're going to be talking about Jesus, fully God. The next week, we're going to be talking about Jesus, fully man. The next week, we're going to talk about Jesus, the great I am, and all the I am statements of Christ as he came into the earth. Then we're going to conclude on Christmas Eve with Jesus is the light of the world. So it's going to be a great month, a wonderful opportunity to invite people to church as they are particularly receptive as Christmas time comes around. So I thank you for being here today. Give yourselves a huge round of applause. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he give you peace in Jesus' name. Live your lives to make a difference in the lives of others. Have a great day, everybody. God bless you. If you're new to Journey Church and we haven't met, I'd love to meet you. I'll be right up here at the front. I'd love to shake your hand and say hello. Once again, we want to thank you for joining us here for one of our inspiring messages at Journey Church. If you live in the greater Jacksonville area, we want to invite you to come out to one of our weekend experiences. Our service times are Saturday night at 6 p.m., Sunday at 9.30 a.m., or 11.15 a.m. Or if you would like to, you can join us online at any time watching any of our services live at journeychurch.org. We look forward to seeing you next time.